purely that of Blanche and my own, uh, based upon our personal experiences in the industry and do not represent EY as a whole. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't do that uh, if for, to my profession. So I uh, just want to make sure we are rounded off there. Introducing ourselves first, um, I'll, I'll quickly go over uh, my background and then turn it over to Blanche, but uh, I am a manager with EY's legal function consulting team. I've been in the legal consulting space for the past uh, three years, uh, and prior to that, I was in the oil and gas industry working in contracting uh, function as well as supply chain uh, performance management. So the topic today around uh, CLM systems is very near and dear to my heart uh, as I've gone through multiple implementations uh, and have been on both sides of a system, both as a requester, uh, an attorney, as well as a developer, developer and implementer. Uh, Blanche? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Blanche Costa. Um, I am also a manager in the EY Law Legal Function Consulting practice. Um, uh, you know, uh, my background it differs a little bit from Lee in the sense that, that, that I have a, a I am more tech technology driven. I've been in the, the legal space for roughly over 10 years. Um, and and with with I would say that a, a major emphasis on the contract life cycle management and implementing um, the transformations across all areas of contract life cycle management, um, including migration and, and integrations of, of different systems. So this is also a topic that is near and dear to me. Um, I think it's super important that we make sure that we we look at um, you know that those key foundational building blocks as as we start to look at at technology. So thank you, Lee. I'm excited to be here today. Yeah, me yeah, as well. Me. So Quickly going over the topics that we'll discuss today, one of the, the items that uh, is laying the foundation for this discussion is a recent uh, joint survey between EY Law and uh, the Harvard Law School. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, what went into that survey. And then begin to talk about some of the challenges that face uh, organizations in selecting a CLM technology, and then shifting towards the steps and questions that legal departments can ask themselves uh, in helping select the right technology that suits their needs and will enable them for uh, a successful implementation. And then, uh, as Colin mentioned, you know, wrap uh, leave some time for some Q and A. But certainly, as we go along, uh, please, you know, pop questions into the chat box, and, and we'll address those as we can. We want this to be an open and fluid conversation as as we share our thoughts and experiences. So, jumping right in. As I mentioned, uh, EY Law and Harvard Law School did a joint survey of around 2,000 law departments, uh, procurement teams, uh, business enablement or business development groups, and other contracting professionals uh, to explore some of the challenges and initiatives that these groups were taking on with relation to a variety of topics, including uh, legal operations, uh, contracting, uh, entity uh, uh, governance uh, and compliance issues. And this, has, this is something that is uh, currently being rolled out. I know that there are several uh, presentations uh, and seminars being done uh, to talk about these more in depth but we wanted to bring some of the key elements from this survey to your attention as we feel they're very relevant to the conversation and can help guide the process uh, in selecting a technology. Um, 
the specific portion of the EY law survey that we're focusing on, it was broken up into three parts. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the contracting section of that survey. And out of, you know, the, the hundred or so questions that were asked as part of this survey, you know, we really felt that there were some key observations with regards to uh, the current processes and practices that law departments are de uh, employing, um, the talent and resourcing efforts that are going on, and then the performance uh, and challenges that these groups are facing uh, as they go about either selecting a CLM technology or maintaining it. Uh, this applies, as I mentioned, to both buy side and sell side services. So if you're on the procurement side, this is just as relevant as if you were on uh, the client facing side. So without further ado, let's jump into it. And let's start off with the challenges in selecting the right technology. As part of the survey, we asked organizations, you know, whether or not they were facing challenges with their contracting technology and whether they felt that they had sufficient visibility into the contracts that they were facilitating. As you can see, it was a resounding, yes, we have problems. And not every group had the same challenges that they were facing. Uh, some, you know, they were spending a lot more time than they anticipated in identifying the right technology. Others felt that the deployment or implementation of that technology was far exceeding their initial estimates. And again, you know, when they did were able to select a technology and they were able to implement it, many felt as though the technology really didn't solve the objectives and goals um, that they had. And so, this, you know, if, if you're out there and you're feeling as though, you know, you're the only one suffering from uh, challenges in selecting or implementing your technology, you're not alone. Uh, vast majority of departments, you know, are, are uh, suffering in the same way. And we want, you know, this to be acknowledged that it is a very complex and challenging process but we feel that there are certain key foundational steps that you can take uh, when beginning this journey to help mitigate and ease that pain. So Blanche, um, I think that, you know, this would be a great opportunity uh, for you to kind of lay out uh, some of these steps that we've put together. Yeah, of course, thank you. So. Introducing this slide of, of kind of industry leading steps to, to what we have from, from our experience is kind of a, a, a successful CLM transformation. And one of the key kind of things to take away from this slide is really the importance of the foundational building blocks prior to selecting the technology. And so from what we have experienced, we recommend, you know, really taking a deep dive into what is your processes, what works well today, and, and also what, what doesn't work well. And, and really taking that deep kind of understanding and looking under the hood of, okay, do I have processes? Are, are they actually being followed? Are they socialized? And, and also looking at what your current processes are and, and looking at those kind of in, in the future of, of what would be best in class and what would be best for your organization. So each of these items kind of here as these foundational building blocks, we will go into detail throughout this um, presentation today, but I really just want to touch on a couple of key points in terms of the process, which I just touched on, the talent model of, of looking at kind of, you know, your, your current skill set but also do we have the right people doing the right things? And, and are those internal, you know, are those external resources? And really evaluating what our talent model is today to what the kind of company strategy talent model is and, and taking a deep view into that and, and understanding the gaps. 
which then basically kind of builds us into this sourcing model of kind of the, the solution, right? Of, okay, so we have X, X resources, but, but is that really the skill set that's required? Do we want to look at outsourcing or do we want to keep this in house? And also, kind of probably one of the better examples is looking at it from, you know, do we have a lot of low risk work that is very high volume that we could look at at gaining efficiency and reducing costs by by looking at this and, and potentially altering it in the future. And then one of my favorite topics here is, is data, right? You know, really truly understanding your data. And also, you know, what are the, the ultimate drivers and, and what is your ultimate goal for the technology that you're looking to, to solution? And, you know, looking at what are those, those KPIs and different metrics that you're also looking to get as an outcome. And, and what we've found is by really taking the time to build those foundational building blocks at the on front of selecting the technology, not only does your implementation run smoother, but you're also looking at kind of a holistic view to get your end goal, right? So I'm gonna jump into to our next slide, um, which, which uh, builds upon this of what do we need to do prior to kicking off kind of that first step in that pyramid? And really one of the key things that we recommend looking into is, you know, that saying of start with the end in mind, right? So what is it that your end goal, what are you trying to solve for? And, and articulate that vision, put pen to paper on this and, and determine the, the, the scope too as well, right? So what is it that not only are you trying to solve for from a business, but, but what is the scope of the problem from a contract life cycle management perspective, are you trying to address? Then we look at, okay, do we have the right people involved to actually execute on this initiative and transformation we're looking to drive? And finally, which is one of, well, well, these are all very important, I really like to hone in on the governance aspect of this. It's, it's very quick to, to forget, but it's a key piece to, to the progression and success of, of, of not the building blocks, but the selection and the success of the overarching transformation and really looking at kind of the roles and responsibilities, you know, and, and, and this governance, I like to kind of think of it as, as twofold. One is governance around the project in and of itself, but then also the governance of the actual execution of the work that we're looking to do in kind of a business as usual, as I would call it, steady state. So, so it is twofold. Um, so I, I will pause here um, and, and hand it back over to, um, to, to Lee um, to walk us through this, this next slide. And sorry, Lee, I, I hit the button a little quick. No worries. No, and thank you, Blanche. That, that was a great walkthrough in some of these initial steps. And, you know, one of the points um, that you saw previously on, on the slide and, and what Blanche touched upon was establishing, you know, the stakeholder committee that is going to um, govern the project. And the question always, you know, comes up, well, well who owns it? And we actually put this question uh, to our respondents in the survey. And as you'll see, while there was some strong preference towards the legal department and contracting function, uh, it wasn't necessarily a unanimous decision on who would own the process. And that is going to be a really critical key in getting the project going and ensuring that the project has the proper support and guidance throughout is deciding what group is going to ultimately hold the decisions as part of the process. But it 
in addition to that, making sure that all other impacted functional groups have a seat at the table and are able to provide feedback uh, and are able to assist in being apprised of developments in the project as well as being able to uh, pr you know, provide feedback on those elements and, and help steer it appropriately. So whether you know your culture dictates that the legal department handles any technology or, or processes around uh, contracting, or if your business group uh, typically owns that with legal as a sub-function of that business unit, it's okay. It doesn't always need to be driven by legal, but a decision does need to be made as to who is ultimately going to be responsible for the project and then ensuring that all other groups are brought to the table, uh, consulted, and are continuously uh, kept up to date with how the project is progressing. So Blanche, um, I, you know, on the topic of starting to, you know, bring the group together and looking at, you know, the what the current state of the contracting function is, uh, what guidance do you have on that front, uh, and what questions would you begin to ask internally? Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Lee. And so coming back to kind of, and I'll continue to kind of reference that pyramid slide, um, you know. It, and really looking at first of what is the current state, which is a really key um, aspect of success, of really understanding what is that current state process and, and looking across not only your specific department, but other departments that touch on contracting, right? And identifying where those bottlenecks occur but also where are those opportunities for improvement? And so for example, in, in you know, a couple of clients that we've worked with uh, uh, across my, my tenure is, hey, I have this process and, and I need it to be this way, but we have another department within the same company that is adamant that we have a, a different process. And really trying to understand and, and work together to understand the why behind it. Why is it that you really need to have two separate processes? And, 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 and is it the most efficient process? You know, another example to bring in are, as we all are very uh, aware, are our, our handoffs, right, in, in the process. Are our handoffs as efficient as they possibly could be? And, and are they done, you know, when we look at, you know, selecting a technology versus also looking to enhance a technology, um, you know, we always kind of want to try our best to put aside kind of the tech aspect of it and understand what the business needs are and understanding not only, hey, this is what my business needs, but then how can we also work together with what the overall company initiative is, which most likely will be to standardize, right? So really trying to kind of hone in on some of those examples, but then putting pen to paper, I cannot express the importance of documenting your current state and, and validating it across the different businesses and, and having input and, and, and ultimately, you know, validating that with your stakeholder group, right? Because that's a really key important piece that everybody says, I have a process, I've got it, I know it, I'm following it. But if it's not down on paper or it's not kind of in policy or, or controlled fashion, it, 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 can be, can, it will become problematic. Um, and then a couple other points here around the current state is, is obviously, you know, the data and the data model, you know, there's so much to discuss about data in, in terms of, of, you know, where is the sources coming from that we are, are pulling together? You know, are we looking, for example, to consolidate it from five systems into one system? You know, do we need to look across and 
understand those those differences between the data model and and and, and do a data model exercise. Um, you know, do do we have access? Are there limitations to to this? Are certain people only ever allowed to see certain data? Um, you know, and, and then my my most favorite one is is the actually is the, is the data good? You know, I, I have this kind of saying of garbage in, garbage out. You know, if we get to start with a blank slate, and and we get to redefine and reimagine and transform, you know, we also have to put that on the page uh, on the blank slate too. Of of you know, what can we reuse and and reimagine versus what do we need to actually go back and and revalidate. So a lot of things to really think about and, and depending on kind of what you're kind of coming back to the point of, you know, starting at the end, you know, of what are your goals and what are you trying to achieve, which will drive, you know, where we need to spend and spend the time on this current state assessment around the data model and around your processes. You know, the, the next big one is is templates and clauses. Um, this is a really fascinating one for me, and one that's close close to heart. Um, is you know you, you over your time, and I'm sure everyone on this call can can um, feel me on this one. Is do you actually know where all your templates are? Um, <laughs> and not only do you know where they all are. Do you know the volumes of them? You know, and and there are some clients that we work with that say, yes, I know all my templates. I have them in a localized repository. I can hand these over to you, which is a a a different starting point than. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I know I have some some templates that that reside in in system A. Some reside on people's desktops. Some in SharePoint. And so that's a starting point, right? To go out there and index and collect and and review to to get to get us into kind of that ultimate goal of potentially a, a data repository, right? So you have one golden source for all your contracts. Um, and so looking at kind of all of those kind of areas, and there's more, of course, uh, depending on each you know situation and goals that that the that you're looking at, but then we say, okay, based on what we've learned in this assessment and current state of, of, of how the business works today, does our timeline make sense? Do our you know key initiatives still align with what, what the goal was when we first started this project? And do we need to recalibrate and, and, and look at them in more detail? So, I know that was probably a lot with a lot of examples, but I am going to kind of jump us into our, our next slide here, which is talking about standardization and consistency. And, you know, from our survey that we've done, I think this is a really great slide to kind of pile on top of the previous slide uh, around process and and if you look here, you'll see we have 25% say, hey, I have a, a defined process, but I don't follow it all the time. We have another kind of 74% that says, hey, I have a follow, I, I have a process defined, and I do follow it all the time. So I'm going to start by talking about the 25% of not following it all the time. And, and kind of obviously, I think everybody can, can agree with this does pose risk, right? And, and how, do we, how, do we, how do we mitigate this, right? And so some of the key areas that we've focused on from our experience is, again, putting pen to paper, documenting this process, embedding it in policies, and also um, uh, sharing it, ensuring that everybody in the business has access to it and understands what process they're supposed to be following. And then on top of that, if, if you, you know, when you get to that point where you're selecting that technology and, and defining, you know, some of the data points you want to capture, 
put a put a put a, a requirement in to say, hey, we need to be able to track if people are not following the processes. And, and how can we do that to ensure that we are compliant and we are mitigating that risk? Um, moving over to, hey, we, we do follow a defined process. I challenge that on another lens of just because you have a process, is it the best process? Is it the most optimized and efficient process? Um, and, and kind of moving over into some of the challenges here, you can clearly see that about 70% of contracts, they don't typically follow the, the playbook or, or the guidance, right? And, and how do we build protocols to make sure that those are followed, right? And, and then looking at kind of negotiating and redlining kind of, you know, do we do we have pre-approved fallback terms? Have we reviewed the templates and understand them in depth to be able to ultimately create a, a, a clause library, for example, um, and 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 building on on these foundational building blocks to to get to that kind of best in class. So, um, with that said. Um, I am going to move into kind of some some key areas to think about um, if I can get to the, to the next slide here around, um, you know, how do we how do we create standard processes and how do we drive that efficiency and, and manage and really mitigate that risk? And what have we seen, you know, in the market. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I kind of spoke to really early on is is kind of you know, broken processes will lead to a broken system. So really, truly taking that time ahead of that selection and understanding your current state process and understanding, you know, what what future will look like will ultimately drive you to that right selection. And so a couple of key things to really think about when standardizing is, is your templates and, and your language and, you know, once you kind of get through that initial stage of I know where all of my templates are and I have them all, then it's how can I harmonize some of those and, and how can we look to, to make our processes more efficient, you know, defining who owns the templates and who owns the clauses, you know, um, you know, understanding what those legal terms are and, and, and kind of doing a deep dive in into that will help us drive those standardizations so that we don't have, for example, 15 different master services agreements that are all negotiated in a different manner. Um, let's let's rein that back in and try to get us to one or two and have a very defined playbook that does have those pre-approved fallbacks that, that we can, you know, not have to go out and find the right person to review that language because we changed two words in it. Let's, let's try to define that up front. Um, and, and then, you know, the data. And I can say data, data, data all day long. It's, it's so important um, to, to not only understand your data, to also look to standardize it, but also make sure that you are capturing the right information um, and and getting those, those key metrics, which Lee will get to in a moment, of, of making sure that you are able to not only have the right data in the system, be able to track the right data, but then also be able to report on that data, which is ultimately our end goal, right? And, yeah. and then that you know, can lead into some of these other data extraction you know, protocols of, of looking at, at, at different areas of the data. So I, I'm going to pause here for a second and, and see. It looks like we have a couple of, of, of items in the chat. Um, and so, yeah. Lee, I don't know if you, you see probably like you've been able to read those if you want to kind of speak to some of those, um, if there's sure. any open ones. Certainly. And David, we haven't forgotten about you. Um, we do have a, a, a quick bit on KPIs and, and thinking about data. So I, I do want to get to that and address that because it's a... Uh, uh, definitely a, a great topic uh, to discuss now. And Frank's question has been, you know, have you seen technology implemented 
to not allow uh, 25% that we talked about that don't always follow the process? Uh, how do we keep them from circumventing um, that process? And so in my experience, and, and Blanche, I, I want to kick this back to you um, after I've had a chance here to respond, um, is, is that this is a combination of, of technology change management and policy. The technology at the end of the day is there to enable the policies to uh, to help drive the process. And it's not going to be the complete solution because where there is a will, there is a way and not to uh, beat up on any groups, but certainly there are certain functions within uh, the business that will try and look for whatever means or methods they can to move things forward. And when you have those kind of situations, there needs to be a policy that is clearly communicated on how these particular types of uh, requests or uh, opportunities are driven. And then that needs to just be continuously hammered and reminded into the group. And it doesn't need to be the responsibility of legal. Certainly legal can be a gatekeeper, but part of the process is certainly ensuring that you have the right change champions and change agents in place to continue to drive urgency around adhering to policy and adhering to process and being an advocate for that message. And so certainly what I have seen in the past is, is that Templates are updated, they are then stored within the system, and the only way to get that template, the only way to get a contract is to submit a request into the system so that it is properly logged. It is a huge paradigm shift for a lot of groups, but if there is a significant concern around compliance or that you are trying to drive a particular policy, by securing those templates and making it so that there is only a single funnel for these types of requests to move through, then you are helping drive that compliance and, and reduce the risk. I'm not gonna say that you're gonna be able to eliminate it to completely zero, but you will reduce the occurrence where people are going outside of the process and creating problems down the road. And a lot of that is by looking at your current process, looking for where those deviations occur, and then working with your collaborative stakeholder group to address how you reduce those deviations, how you create compliance, and then letting the system help automate and drive that process forward. Blanche, do you have anything to you want to add to that? Yeah, I just want to kind of piggyback on it and kind of add, you know, a, a little bit of a, a different thought to it is, you know, depending on what it is you're you're looking to, you know, implement, you know, and 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 really kind of like what is your problem statement, right? Like if if it's hey, you know, this contract can't go; it, it has been sent out prior to approval, right? You know, there are mechanisms that certain you know technology can assist with that, right? They can say, you know, for example, you can't, you know, you can't download this document until it's in a certain stage of the process. Or or you, you know, you're you're limited in in these areas. Or if you have everything built out into your system, you can't actually, you know, send anything out to to a you know a counterparty or or a vendor until these steps have been put in place. So those are some areas to kind of think about. The other side of it is reporting. You know, you know, and 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 this is kind of another area that I think is really important around the reporting part, which Lee will get to, but you know, make sure when you're in these these kind of current state processes and, and prior to that selection of really defining what are those areas that we need to ensure we can check on a daily basis or, or that a report can be run and automatically sent to users to say, hey, you are not compliant. You are not following this, you know, and, and, and be ahead of it. So 
you know, there are lots of ways and areas that that these these topics and and issues can be addressed. I think that that one of the things that I'll say here is it's really you know, I can't stress the importance of of doing these this foundational kind of work prior to selecting your technology or or prior to your implementation because it's really hard to go back and and re-engineer things and redefine after you have your system in place. So I'll pause and hand it back over to Lee and see if there's anything else you have to kind of add to this. No, I think those were some great additions. And Frank, hopefully we we answered your question, but certainly if you have, you know, any other um, questions on that topic for, for more detail, we'll be happy to answer those. So one of the topics that we brought up early on, and as you'll remember in that pyramid model, is the talent model as well as the sourcing mix. And I think that this is a topic that's often uh, neglected when looking at a contracting function transformation initiative within clients. So one of the things that we asked about in the survey was some of the challenges that legal resources were finding in you know, facilitating the work that was coming to them. And nearly 90% of them recognized that it was a challenge to manage these high volume, but low complexity, low risk uh, requests that were coming in. So their highly skilled attorneys, uh, you know, were often being tasked with pushing through, facilitating, managing, uh, items that could have been handled by a, a lower cost resource or resource within uh, a different functional team. And what this, you know, type of work does is, is it creates several challenges for a, a legal department in that you, of course, have high cost resources working on low value agreements um, so that uh, you're you're experiencing a higher overhead cost in, in facilitating those agreements um, you are you know spending less time than you're able to or want to on more complex uh, higher value add agreements and you're also you know to some extent demoralizing some of your higher skilled uh, veteran employees that are probably more suited for handling more complex agreements uh, or other legal work within the organization. So the question ultimately becomes, you know, how can we, you know, best ensure that the right work is going to the right people within the organization? And so some of the questions that you want to ask as you're going through this is, you know, have I appropriately identified all of the resources within the organization that are working on our contracts? And what risk are they truly handling and facilitating? If you have identified that you have, you know, a 10-year attorney, you know, that's processing NDAs, you have this opportunity there to shift some of that work off that attorney and to uh, lower cost resources, uh, paralegals, or potentially a you know, shared service center um, by you know, identifying the contracts, cataloging the contracts, um, and trying to standardize those, you can help eliminate uh, the need for higher skilled, uh, higher cost resources in facilitating those contracts and begin the process of moving those towards a more efficient means of facilitation. Uh, additionally, if you find that you have contracts that maybe they are moderately complex, but they're fairly repeatable if you can document the logic and the reasoning behind how those contracts are assembled uh, or drafted or negotiated, you can take either 
part of that process or the entire process off of your higher cost resources and move that to other centers as well. It doesn't necessarily always need to be that, you know, high dollar uh, or moderate dollar, even high risk, moderate risk contracts stay within legal as long as you can appropriately define what uh, responsibilities may lie with other groups and thereby reduce the time and effort required of legal to complete those contracts. Uh, I've worked with a number of organizations that have a multi-step process where uh, first pass reviews are completed uh, by paralegals or other contracting professionals uh, to address a lot of the lower lower hanging fruit on those contracts before being run up to uh, an attorney for final review and sign off. Um, thereby, what might have taken the attorney four hours to go through, the attorney is now only spending an hour on uh, because they have an established process and there's another resource that is able to do some of the footwork behind that. And then finally, you know, certainly you want to evaluate uh, any opportunity for self-service or self-issue. Uh, NDAs are a great example of uh, types of contracts that could be assembled um, by uh, uh, business users um, outside of legal and potentially even issued directly to uh, third parties for review and signature. And this can reduce a great deal of workload um, by the legal department, not just attorneys, but paralegals and other resources that are dedicated to this. Of course, all of this is likely going to be contingent upon any kind of template standardization or harmonization efforts uh, that you've conducted. So this is uh, a hand-in-hand -hand, uh, benefit, uh, if you will, um, of taking that first step in cataloging and assessing your contracts and determining, you know, what kind of standardization, what kind of consistency can you bring to those agreements to help lower the risk profile and potentially move these contracts to a more streamlined, efficient process. In conjunction with evaluating the workflow, you also wanna make sure that you have resources dedicated to monitoring uh, those workflows. And uh, legal operations personnel are you know, quickly becoming a necessity within legal departments. And what they can do is help ensure that processes are being followed. Um, by monitoring the system, as uh, Blanche brought up previously, you know, one of the great ways that you can ensure compliance is if you can't automate it, then at least have reporting capabilities around it and be able to do those audit checks. And by having personnel that are dedicated to monitoring how the system is working and how people are using it, you can help ensure that compliance. Additionally, in their role, they can look for opportunities for continuous improvement. And what I mean by that is if you have the, uh, the data model set up to capture elements of risk in your agreements and you notice, hey, we deviate from this particular clause 70% of the time, the question could become, is it then a, a strategic move on the part of the company to move away from that old provision and to what is, you know, the newly accepted uh, uh, alternative provision. Sometimes it's not always the best answer uh, from a negotiation perspective, but if you find yourself constantly in negotiation and redline and things are taking longer just because of this particular clause and it doesn't provide you any additional protection or value, it's worth consideration that maybe that isn't the best uh, uh, provision to carry forward. And then finally, having someone there that can ensure that your knowledge artifacts are up to date and that continuous training is being offered to not only your legal users, but your end users as well, is certainly beneficial to the adoption and uh, going concern of any uh, uh, CLM uh, transformation. And as we mentioned, you know, ensuring that templates are uh, up to date in the system through conversations with template owners 
ensuring that guidance in any types of playbooks is up to date and that policies and procedures are regularly reviewed is going to be beneficial to any uh, legal department and its end users in the long run. And then finally, just you know, some thoughts on the talent model in and of itself. Um, one of the things that we mentioned is you know the morale of your legal resources and making sure that you have a clear progression plan for those resources is certainly going to address any concerns or challenges around morale and things that you can think about is okay we have you know potentially individual council contributors uh, uh, aligned to specific business lines but then is there any upward mobility into either overseeing a groups of council members or being uh, moved into different work streams uh, based upon a regular uh, cyclical nature of ensuring that people are uh, learning new talents, uh, being exposed to different practice areas, and then working in areas that uh, are of interest to them. And then finally, you know, one of uh, the chief concerns for any law department should be once we have established a process, what do we do when the unexpected comes about? And many uh, legal groups are operating very lean today. Um, you know, uh, legal is constantly being asked to do more with the budget that they have. And so it's imperative that there is a contingency plan around resourcing for uh, any process. So cross-training is critical to ensure that if you have four attorneys uh, dedicated to the department and they are 110% utilized uh, for work, that they have a shared knowledge in at least some aspects and can backfill for attorneys if there is an unexpected leave um, or uh, a planned leave even at that um, so that you aren't left high and dry, the process falls apart and people begin to blame, uh, you know, what is not really the issue of the process being broken, but just that we don't have the, the, the resources available to handle it. So having that contingency plan, making sure that folks are cross-trained and that you can handle either unexpected leaves or surge capacity, especially if you're uh, in a seasonal or cyclical business, is paramount to uh, the success uh, of any process that uh, is implemented in the system. So we've talked about, you know, putting processes in place. We've talked about the people that are going to facilitate that process and how we can get the, the right work to those people. Uh, one of the questions that was asked and we, we're finally getting to is, is how do we begin to measure our success and how do we measure our performance? And I'm going to ask Blanche to weigh in here after after a bit of covering some of these topics. Um, but uh, Blanche and I are both, you know, technology background, very data centric kind of individuals. We we laugh in in how much we we think alike in in, uh, in approaching projects such as these. And you know, the first and foremost, you know, puzzle that you need to solve is what data do you want to be able to see at the end of the day? Uh, many groups are driven by many different facets, and it really helps when you start thinking about what data do you want to be able to extract at the end of the day. And starting off with a data model that addresses all your needs. Some legal departments uh, are very focused on obligation management and risk mitigation. And so their data model may be very different from a legal department that is, their main strategy and vision is to enable the business in their venture. And so it's, it's important to understand, again, what your vision is, what your scope is, and then beginning to put down, okay, to achieve that, what information do I need out of the system? And how can I use that data to help me 
drive continuous improvement within de- my, my department. Mm-hmm. Supplemental to that, you want to also go to your business users and make sure that you understand what data they are expecting to get out of the system. They may not have some of this data in their CRM, if they even have one, or access to this, and maybe they're pulling very manual reports. So understanding what data they want and how they want that to be captured and reported back to them is also going to be critical to helping you set up your data model. So asking them, hey, what reports are you you using? Uh, Can I see those? And then what information do you not have right now is really going to help you, you know, answer those questions. And Blanche, do you have anything that you want to add quickly to that before I jump to the last bits? Yeah, no, I, I think you you hit on it a, a really, really to the point, you know, the only thing to just kind of, I guess, add to is, you know, what is it that you don't have that, that you want to be able to have and or report on? Um, and, and I think to, to your point too, Lee, is, depending on what your goals are up front, right? And, and what is your your end look at, at what does success look like? This will also help you drive what metrics you want to be able to capture and, and align to up front and, and look at, hey, these are the key points that I want. So these need to be part of my data model. And, and these are the, those key aspects. So no, I think Lee, you you hit it you hit it home, and and I think it's just yeah. something that is really important to think about upfront, mm. which is really easily forgotten. I think in 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 these in this implementation process, from my experience. Um, yeah. No, and and I want to get to David's question because it's a great question, and I think there are two different paths of thought on this, both worthy of consideration, both should be you know. Uh, plan for in any type of CLM technology implementation. You want to be able to create metrics that show the success of the implementation, but then you also want to create metrics for the ongoing operation of the CLM system. And what I mean by this are um, it, you want a day zero kind of scorecard for when you're implementing a system and to think about and to show you know how the, the system is immediately impacting the organization. And that's not going to be dollars and cents. That's not going to be cycle time. What that's really going to show groups is, hey, how many templates did we originally identify? And now how many templates have we either consolidated down to or have we moved into the system from a very manual to an automated process? How many playbooks have we brought in, reviewed, and now applied to those contracts? How many you know uh, users are we bringing in and creating the the visibility that may not have existed into the contracting function beforehand. So now all of a sudden you say, you know, this this ambiguous contracting, ambiguous legal world that was out there, now all of a sudden anybody can log in and they have immediate, you know, top-down view into this is our contracting world. This is what it actually exists, you know, consists of. And it actually opens up a lot of eyes that they didn't know you know, all these people were submitting requests, all these, you know, templates out there existed. It creates, you know, uh, a, a an understanding that typically didn't exist beforehand. And then on the other side, in, in, in measuring for the future, as I said, you know, some of the things that are critical into understanding are evaluating risk. And risk can be a variety of measures, including, you know, the you know, existence of certain clauses, the values of agreements, um, you know, being able to uh, connect agreements that are related to one another, either parent child, or, you know, uh, when you have teaming agreements or subcontracting agreements, being able to relate those back, uh, being able to track, you know, the cycle time of attorneys as a contract moves through its various stages from drafting to negotiation to being out with the client and understanding the actual life of a contract so that you can begin mm-hmm. to establishing baselines for service delivery. Mm-hmm. There are lots of, you know, <laughs> ways that you can measure it and you just have to sit down and understand, and again, going back to the beginning, what is your vision? What is your scope? And then figuring out what are the metrics that are, that are mm-hmm. going to, deliver or prove those items. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and as you guys can see here, Lee and I can talk about this all day long. Um, <laughs> it, it's a passion. So, so we do very much appreciate you guys, you know, being part of this, this journey with us today. Um, and, and to kind of tee us up, I think, you know, and, and kind of pulling this back to the full circle, I, I do bring back up this, this pyramid here. And, you know, coming back to the importance of those foundational building blocks of all, you know, process, talent, sourcing data, ultimately will give you the knowledge, experience, and information for you to go out and pick the best technology in the market for what you're trying to solve for. Um, and so I, I know we have, you know, three minutes left. Um, and I thought that with that, I would just pause for a moment and see if there's any questions that, that you guys wanna ask via chat. Um, or if you want us to kind of touch on in the last couple of minutes in more detail. Hey, Blanche. Hey, Blanche. I'm just, I'm just going to jump in before anybody types a question. So let's say we get to the tech point of it. And we run the model. By the way, this was a fascinating presentation. I've been taking notes throughout. This is awesome. Um, just want to address one question. Uh, somebody said, can we share the slide deck afterwards? Is that okay with you guys? Um, I, I believe we have to refer back to Alex on, on that one. Um, so I believe that, that maybe we could just figure that one out offline and come back to you. But but we absolutely see and understand. We just have to make sure we, we follow our, our UI policies. Yeah, yep. per perfect, perfect. Okay, I'll follow up later, Jared. Uh, so the question I have is like, okay, it's CLM is CLM, right? It's been in the <coughs> box for a while. But what we've seen over the past couple of years is like, hey, we see we've seen like companies running ahead like uh, recently um uh, you know we we had a uh, filevine by another company we had contract room being, being acquired by metrotech you know i i think you're very familiar with docusun by and spring cm seal we're we're we're, seeing, we're not we're not just looking at clm any, anymore like contract pod ai you know uh, uh recently just uh to have a workflow tool built in are we are we looking at the whole ecosystem now when we're asking these questions to get to the point of tech or is it just clm because you know there's there's post and pre-signature there's workflows in between there's new things we're considering like the rest of the the business just in the, you know other than yeah. the sales mm -hmm. requirement there's compliance right yeah no nope. uh, mm -hmm. so i can take a first out of this and then lee you know by all means jump on top of it it was actually um a topic I was discussing with a colleague actually earlier this week, specifically around you know the the the, the trends in the market and you know uh, you know a couple of of kind of new initiatives is that we're working towards is kind of more or less like an overarching procurement transformation, right? Which is looking at kind of the, the, that whole picture, right? And and not just the contracting piece, and and how there are kind of systems that are coming out in the market that that do allow to to look at that entire process in one and and are integrated. And so I think to, to kind of your question, it really depends on kind of that that what are we trying to solve for, right? Are we trying to just sit, solve for a contracting life cycle management system that will integrate into an existing overarching program or are we looking at the, the holistic view or are we looking at you know just one piece of the the contract life cycle management process right and so i i, I think that it's a, a great question i think that if if you're looking for that big picture I think that your technology selection is going to be a little bit different than if you're just looking at, at implementing contract lifecycle management. Um, so, so absolutely a great question. And, and it is something that, that you're right is, is coming up in the market to, uh, as kind of a, a transformational program as well. Um, so I'll pause there and see Lee, if, if you have different thoughts on that as well. 
No, I agree. I think that's where the industry is moving towards is is a consolidation of some of the key tools in the industry. Not to say that there won't be continuous new players trying to focus in on particular point solutions, but I do think that's where it's moving. And I personally like a nice, neat package, um, but that isn't to say that if you have certain priorities within your organization, certain needs, that there might not be point solutions out there that are best suited for you. There are great tools out there that do certain aspects of pre-execution and post-execution activities far better than some of the complete packages, if you will. But then the consideration that goes along with that is, is that you will likely have additional integration and maintenance costs on top of maintaining the connections between those systems um, and ongoing support as those systems continue to evolve and may change those connections between them. So there is a, a certainly strategy and considerations around picking which uh, path you choose. Uh, it's more just ensuring that it aligns with your priorities and ensuring that you're meeting your objectives. Fantastic, guys. Looks like we've gone over the top of the hour. Blanche, Lee, thanks for your leadership. Evoy Law, crushing it. Really enjoyed the presentation. Um, I will follow up with everybody. Tindies, thank you very, very much uh, for your participation and being involved. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.